Hi, I'm Gwen. So if this was gonna be a 10 second video, what I would tell you is gut feeling, which is my least favorite thing in the world. I'm hyper analytical, analytical. I like spreadsheets, I like pros and cons lists, I like facts, but that's just not how this process is. So let's break it down a little bit. So the first part of this video is going to be sort of go taking you through the process of sort of this whole school year and how my thoughts changed about where I was gonna to go to school. And then if you want to skip ahead to just the Williams versus Amherst plus a little bit of Grinnell, click here. Hopefully this works. My goal here is not to slander any schools. It is to tell you what my experience was like in the hopes that it can help you as you make this decision or just because you think it's interesting or whatever. If I'm wrong about any information here, please, please say something in the, in the comments. Uh, I'm gonna put a disclaimer here. We're gonna pause real quick. I am in the incredibly privileged position of financial aid not being a big part of my college making decision. That is a huge privilege that I do not take lightly. And it is a massive part of the college decision and application process for many, many, I'd even say most applicants. Um, and so my experience is different in that way. I'm just putting that out there first and I really want to emphasize that. But then I have to go forward and explain how it actually was for me. So the order that you get your acceptance letters in matters. Essentially, first I applied to some safety schools. I heard back from these over the summer. Um, I applied to these for a reason, not just for kicks. Like I, I was, it was important to me to have some safety schools that were nearby on the table. In mid December, between late November and like mid December, I heard back from Knox College, Lawrence University, and the College of Worcester. These are all mid-tier schools, small liberal arts schools that I was somewhat interested in. So what that told me is hearing back from them much earlier than I expected to. So they got back to me in their early decision pile, even though I hadn't applied as technically an early applicant told me I was an especially strong applicant to them. The financial aid packages that I was offered from them also told me, you know, because it was merit aid, that I was a strong applicant to them. And that's a good sign because that tells me that I'm gonna be competitive at more selective schools. And so I knew I was somewhere in the realm between getting rejected from Stanford early and getting into these mid-tier liberal arts schools with generous financial aid. So that's, that's a big, space to be in, but as you go through this process, you get a better idea of where you stand at other schools. So at that point, Lawrence and Worcester were sort of at the top of my list. Worcester was the single best experience I had visiting any college. I had a one-on-one -on -one tour, which is the only school where I ever had that. They were just so, it was so personal and the facilities were gorgeous, the area was gorgeous. And so having that experience is what put Worcester towards the top. They also have a marching band, which would be really fun for me. They, they pride themselves in their music and their arts, which is really important to me. For Lawrence, they offer something very different, um, which is the conservatory. So they have an opportunity to study at a conservatory or at least have access to the conservatory resources, even if you're just a student at the college, which is super rare. So you'll find as you go through this process, activities are gonna matter different amounts for different people. And I would say this is when I knew I wasn't gonna go into the super safety school that I applied to and heard back from over the summer. Once you know you're not going to a given school, you should withdraw your application. It's the responsible thing to do. You don't wanna be taking up somebody else's spot or somebody else's financial aid. So then you have several months of stagnancy, which is miserable, just waiting and waiting and waiting. <laughs> but eventually um, in March, I heard back from the rest of the schools. So the first school I heard back from was the University of Richmond. Sometimes you're looking at college essay prompts and something sparks an idea and you just sort of go with it and that's what happened with Richmond. It was the first, you know, very selective school that I'd gotten in. So I started doing a lot, a lot, a lot of research, figuring out about the programs that were most important to me. You know, what I didn't like as much was that it was more in a city um, and I, I'm worried that would be too overwhelming or I'd spend too much time off campus. I also saw that they're grad students, so I got sort of worried about them taking research opportunities, which is something you hear a lot from a lot at the small liberal arts colleges. And so then the next thing that I did, which is so, so important, was to reach out to people. They had um, like student amb ambassadors whose email addresses you could find super easily. And you just gotta be honest. I asked them my questions. I told them things that I didn't think I liked about the school. You do it in a polite way, obviously, but they wanna help and they can't help unless you know what your concerns are. I also reached out to the music faculty to say, here, here's what I want out of my college music experience. What can you offer me? Basically, obviously more politely than that. Um, and yeah, I did, did virtual tours. So then that same night I heard back from Grinnell, 
As I mentioned in my previous video, my parents went to Grinnell. Um, so this was super, super exciting for them. And this brings up another pressure point in this college making decisions process, which is sometimes you have family pressure you to go to a certain school over another. And that's hard to grapple with because my whole life I've been hearing about how wonderful Grinnell is. And I know that Grinnell's wonderful and I know that I like the people there. And you know, I wrote an essay for Grinnell on how I am a Grinnellian. And it was true because I was raised by two Grinnellians. I mean, they were also very generous with their financial aid, which is another thing you'll find at these top tier schools. Um, fewer and fewer of them offer um, merit-based aid because they're so good about providing need-based aids that anybody who is qualified can go to their college. Um, so it's just another balancing act. It was a couple days after this that we started realizing we were not going to be able to travel. So this whole year I've been banking on being able to visit colleges in late March and April. That's why I didn't apply to Williams early, which would have saved me a whole lot of heartache and, and pain for the rest of the year, is because I did not have time to visit in the fall. I had visited most of these schools at some point, but a lot of those were during or immediately after sophomore year, which is a long time ago, and all of them were basically very brief visits in a big tour group. So you can get some information from that, but it's so different than the overnight visits that you go to, the admitted students weekends that you go to, where you're going to classes and you're spending a night with a real student and you're hanging out with the students and eating the food and just living there. Um, and that's what I was banking on being able to have. So when I started realizing that, I did what I was going to do anyway, which is just a lot of research online. Because I had free time, because it was spring break and school was canceled, my voice is getting raspy. It's because I never talk because it's COVID and I never interact with humans anymore. It's terrible. You can find out stuff on forums online, rate my professor's college confidential. You can find out stuff on the college's websites. You can find out stuff on social media. You can go to the YouTube videos. YouTube videos are useful, which is why I'm making this channel. And to an extent, those can be better resources for which programs are stronger at any given school, or maybe what clubs are offered. But you have to take all those with a grain of salt, because if you're getting information from a forum, those people are not super reliable. You have to average out all the information you're getting from those. If you're getting information from the college itself, that information isn't always updated, or it's, it's always the best version of it, because you know, that's an advertisement for that school. And so I found whether you're looking for straight factual information or for information just on the vibe and just getting to know what people are like, talking to people is the most effective way to do that. To current students and staff, as well as um, my future peers, the class of 24 people in the group chats that we've created. So those are the resources that ended up being super useful, just getting as many data points as I possibly could. So I think the next school I was accepted to was Case Western Reserve, which is a school I never visited. It's a, it's a great university. It's similar in many ways, I think, to University of Richmond in that it's a more urban setting, which, which has its positives because you have access to a city, which is great. Um, Case Western also has a very strong music department, but like Richmond, it's a lot bigger, or at least bigger compared to tiny liberal arts colleges. And so at this point, I'd say that Grinnell was at the top, but I didn't really see myself going there. And, and then University of Richmond and Case Western were sort of tied, but this is just obviously constantly in flux. But at this point, based on the schools that I've gotten into so far, I didn't really think I was going to get into Amherst, but if I did, it would far and away take the first place. Um, so I got into Amherst, and if you saw the previous video, I mean, I was in tears. I was so thrilled. Every morning I would wake up and I would think, I got into Amherst. I mean, it was huge. And I spent the next week doing lots and lots of research on Amherst. You know, I'd throw in some information from Case Western and Grinnell and Richmond occasionally, but that, at that point I was like, Amherst. And going into Williams, I'd started to get a little more optimistic that I'd be that I'd get in because I'd gotten into Amherst. But then because I was waitlisted at Bates and Colby and rejected from Claremont McKenna, I was like, well, maybe not. Maybe Amherst was just sort of a fluke. So expectations are all a, a mess. But at this point, I had so much time. You know, six days is a lot of time when you have nothing else to do with your life. I had so much time to get excited for Amherst. And at that point, to be completely honest, I was sort of hoping not to get into Williams because I knew that decision would torture me. And then I got into Williams, and I, I still had to hear back from Harvard, which I knew I wasn't getting into because my essay was garbage. And there is Tulane, 
which I would have seriously considered under different circumstances, but I knew getting into Williams and Amherst, Tulane was no longer on the table. So as I sort of reconsidered, Williams, Amherst, and Grinnell were my top three. Some people don't think Grinnell really belongs in that list. It was really about family pressure, um, which isn't great in some ways, but it is a fantastic school. I mean, it, it really is. It's one of the best in the country. I think they're ranked the best undergraduate teaching of any college in the country. <clears throat> My voice sounds really bad, I'm sorry. And they were offering me the best financial aid. But as I started making pros and cons lists, it became clear that despite being a phenomenal school that had been on my list for as long as any school, it wasn't gonna be right for me. So now we're into the part of the video that's sort of Amherst versus Williams, plus also Grinnell. <laughs> so from when I visited Williams the summer after my sophomore year to December-ish of this past year, Williams was my first choice-ish. Sort of tied with Stanford, whatever. Um, then I started sort of learning more about Williams and I got more concerned about sort of the, the very athletic feel and the very preppy private school sort of feel that I was hearing more about. And I was like, that doesn't sound like me. And so then I was like, well, maybe Amherst is my first choice because they have some music stuff that really appeals to me, but isn't Amherst just gonna be just as bad in terms of preppy East Coast private school feel? So I was, <laughs> it was very bad timing with all of this because as I was going into getting my decisions, I didn't know what my first choice was. And then I got into Williams and I had a few days of like, I got excited about Amherst, I had been having misgivings about Williams, I should go to Amherst, and then I had a few days of, I was just kidding myself about those misgivings. Williams has been my dream for so many years, I got in, why can't I just take that? Um, there was, there was a point in time, I think, when I knew I was going to Williams, and I hadn't fully justified it to myself yet, and I certain wasn't, wasn't, certainly wasn't ready to hit commit yet, but there was a time, I hate to say, deep inside, in my heart, I knew it to be true, but I did, sort of. I had similar concerns with both schools. I was worried about this, this preppy vibe that I've talked about, that I just can't really understand. I'm a Midwesterner, I go to a big public school, as I've mentioned, I am financially privileged in many ways. Dude, I don't know, I keep watching Gossip Girl, and I know Gossip Girl is an exaggeration, but that's what I'm worried about. And I knew that wasn't going to be the case at Grinnell, Grinnell, which is again why Grinnell stayed on the table, because Grinnell is a bunch of Midwesterners and people who want to go live in the middle of nowhere in the Midwest at a super, super liberal school. I also especially requested to talk to people from my state, since there are very few people from my state at these schools, and they basically said, yeah, it's present, but you can find your people, um, and there's a reason these kids aren't going to Ivy Leagues. Most of them could be going to an Ivy if they wanted to, and they didn't want that. They wanted this because it's a little less overbearing of that, of that culture. Um, but doing that is a great way to talk to a current student who's not an admissions representative. Then the next big thing that I was worried about is this athleticism. I am not an athlete. I am a musician, um, and first and foremost, you know, I'm there for academia. Now, I'd say as coming from a big public high school, there is t a tiny amount of overlap between the serious athletes and the people who are serious academically. The more that you add it, the more I feel like maybe it's the people who are more serious academically who also happen to play a sport. And they're good, they're good at that sport, that's why they got recruited, but there's also a reason they're doing D3 and there's a reason they're going to a super good college. So what I was really worried about is that it's going to be all these like student athlete types just dominating these colleges. What I've heard from students is that the student athletes deserve to be there academically, and even if their sport takes up a lot of time during the on season, they are there for the academics. They just that's also their activity. Everybody has an activity for them. It's their sport. Students that Williams might have a higher percentage of the student body involved in athletics, but also Amherst more people talked about the prevalence of student athletes and sort of like if you want to go to the parties you have to be with an athlete or you have to be an athlete like those are how all the parties are. Um, not that I care that much about the party scene but it sort of says more about this, the college atmosphere as a whole. So that was, that was a big concern going to all this for me but it seems like it's pretty similar at both the schools and it's also something that's just impossible to gauge without actually going there. So without getting into specifics or anything too personal let's talk a little bit about my interactions with my future classmates. At Amherst, with the class of 24 people, which is a hard group to analyze because not all of them are going to go to Amherst. They're not necessarily representative of Amherst. And also it's just random which students are going to end up going in the group chat and being active in the group chat. 
Um, they were really nice people and they were fun to talk to. But I just, I never quite felt like I fit in and I always felt like I was trying to sort of impress them or like trying to show them how cool I was and I never quite felt like I could be like myself. And obviously when you're meeting new people and people you want to impress, you're always a little on edge. But it just, it didn't feel right. They didn't feel like me. We did Zoom calls with both of these groups and at one of the Williams ones, somebody asked me a question um, and it ended up be resulting in me going on like a five minute long tangent about this political thing that I'd been involved with. I, I felt so bad and I was like, I'm, I'm sorry, I just took up a bunch of time talking and I didn't want to make it about me. And they were all just like, no, that is so cool. And they were so just genuinely interested in hearing about me. And I just felt like I was genuinely connecting with them. Something else that I noticed is that actually in both of these groups, people shared their Myers-Briggs types. I'm not a big fan of, of Myers-Briggs. I, I have read studies saying that they're not super legit. But regardless, what I noticed uh, is that all of the Amherst people, nearly all of them were extroverts and nearly all of the Williams folks were introverts. And what I actually discovered in interacting with these two similar but different groups of people is that despite being very extroverted and very passionate myself, I sort of blended better with the Williams folks because in my last few years of high school, I've gotten much more confident in myself and I've been worried about how that's gonna work going to the bottom of the totem pole as a freshman again. Um, and I think if I'm in a group of introverts, as silly as it sounds, I can sort of let my natural leadership work into my social life. But that all just goes to say that all this is very random and I just happened to click and find some people who I really adored in the Williams group chat and that helps me, you know, want to go to school with those people. Now we get to the more concrete things. They have flashy little things, you know? So Williams has a Mountain Day, which is a festival in the fall, and Amherst has their huge school-sponsored, like, parties where you do Build-A-Bears and do painting with bubble tea and fun activities like that. And so those things, those are just added perks. You have to look at the experience as a whole. Mountain Day is not a reason to pick a school, okay? You have to look at the overall, and you get those added perks no matter where you go. You're gonna have some fun added perks, and you're gonna miss out on some. So one of the big differences is obviously location, 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 location. Amherst seems like the perfect college town for my wants. It's an hour drive from Boston, and it sounds like people go to Boston or Northampton, New York City, um, several times a semester, which sounds perfect to me. It's not like you're spending all your time off campus, but you're getting off campus and seeing the sights of the East Coast from time to time. Um, and they also have like smaller towns just to get away the people go to all the time. And there's the town of Amherst, which has a couple grocery stores, so everything you can need is right there. Several, you know, restaurants you can go to downtown. Williams, on the other hand, and a small town. It is a town. Some people say it's a single street. I went there. It's, it's a small town. It's a town. It's where rich people go for vacations. <laughs> you have to drive, or at least ride a bike, to get to, like, a Walmart-type store. I'm just thinking, like, there's got to be some point in this year when I need socks on last-minute notice. And that's a lot easier to do at Amherst than it is at Williams. And I just, I get sort of worried about that, just not being able to get basic necessities. Um, but it sounds like there's enough of a town that there are things to do. If you want to go out to a restaurant. There's a dozen restaurants, but if I need to go see a specialist doctor, things like that take some serious work and some serious planning. Williams is the most gorgeous college campus I've ever seen. I have visited 25 schools. It is the most beautiful. I think you get out to cities less often, which people say is fine because there's lots to do on campus. There's an awesome campus community, possibly stronger than at Amherst. But also, I'm moving a thousand miles away. I want, I've want i been to Boston for like a day. I want to explore it. And I think people do that to an extent, and I think that if I make that a priority and I want to do that, I'll be able to. Um, but it's, it's a little harder to make that work. Then we look at comparisons of the curricula. Hey, that's the plural of curriculum. Look at me go. At least I think it is. Some people try to make this decision based off their intended major. I would warn against that. This is coming from somebody who is very undecided on major. I have a wide variety of interests. The academics of these, at these schools are the best you can get in the world. Like I've mentioned, the professors and the resources and the alums and the class sizes and the people you're gonna be doing this work with and the research opportunities you're gonna have. No matter which academic field you look at, you can get a phenomenal education at either school. That being said, either school has a couple departments that are that are strong at that school. For Williams, that's econ and art history. The Amherst, it can be like more like comp sci. I would not let your major make your decision. 
That being said, talk to the professors of your intended major, if you have one, um, and that might make your decision. You know, obviously you don't want to base this whole decision off one bad conversation with one, you know, busy, disgruntled professor or whatever. But if you have a really good personal experience with those people, that can, that can be a nice way to help make your decision. Amherst has a truly open curriculum. Once you pick a major, it's just fulfilling the classes within your major. Other than that, you sort of take whatever you want. Um, obviously, there are going to be certain classes that it makes sense to supplement with your major. There might be prereqs you have to take. Um, but that's why it's so common to a double major or whatever, because there's just so much room to do that. Whereas at Williams, it feels more regimented. Um, on, on paper, it seems like a lot. So I think they have three different divisions of classes. You have to take a few classes from each division. So it's, it's more complicated than this, but it's roughly like math, science, and arts and social studies writing, sort of, kind of, something like that. In addition, there's obviously your major requirements. If you want to study abroad, you have to take a class in the language of the country that you're going to. There's a PE requirement. It's like you have to take four quarters of PE. I think it's dumb. But essentially, at the end of the day, the classes that you take at either school are probably almost identical. I, I, I didn't like initially having all those extra boxes to check just because I get stressed out. Like, it's just more things on my to-do list. That, that stresses me out. But everybody says it's super easy and not a big deal to take care of. Everybody says the food at Amherst is pretty bad. Some people say it's not that bad. Some people say it's bad. Nobody really says it's good. <laughs> Sometimes they have like super long lines at mealtimes. Which just sort of feels like, I don't know, you're putting a lot of money to go to this school and you can't even, like, like in, in the middle of winter when it's like blowing wind and snowing and minus 12 degrees out and you've been at classes all day and now you have to stand outside for, t for 10 minutes waiting to get in to eat your food. I don't want that, you know? But I will give it Amherst. I think they have an open meal plan required your, your first year so you eat as much as you want. So you have to make sure you're eating the right number of meals a week with Williams. Um, not actually the number of meals that's an issue, I'm sure it's not, but it's just another thing you have to keep track of and make sure you don't go over. So Williams, I think the food is not like amazing, it sounds like it's slightly better than Amherst, um, but they have solid food and just so, so many options, lots of different styles of eating, so there's like grab and go places, there's like two, two or three dining halls, like actual dining halls, there are like cafes. They have their Snar. Williams students are obsessed with Snar. It's like a late night snack bar that just has a bunch of junk food <laughs> that you can use your extra meal swipes at. They have like a Sunday brunch, I think. Maybe. Williams students seem quite happy with the food, whereas Amherst students say it's just okay. In terms of housing, at Williams, um, they have a lot of singles. They say it's very possible to be in a single all four years. And as you're looking at colleges, you will realize that is incredibly rare. If you want a single, which I do as an only child who very much values her privacy. I would like a single. The dorms are quite small. I've seen pictures, the bathrooms are not very nice. You might end up in a double, which is gonna be tiny. Um, and you have, there are a couple other people with doubles and you form like a little pod of like six or eight people. And that pod has a nice big common room that you're gonna share. At Amherst, they have pretty nice spacious dorms from like some of the vlogs I've seen. It's almost entirely doubles, which is standard. It's like nothing, it's not like a terrible thing. That's what most schools have. At Amherst, they say you just get to be really good friends with the people on your floor and your, the people on your floor, people from all over the place, all sorts of different people. At William, you have an entry of like a dozen people, I think, that you get really close with and do a lot of stuff with. But some people say it's actually like not that great and it's just sort of a thing for the first few weeks. I don't know. Um, every school's proud of it. I think they all do probably a pretty good job of welcoming their first years. Williams has a swimming test, which just pissed me off so much. It's during the first, it's, dur it's during orientation. And it's just the fact that they are requiring a single skill that is going to favor the more athletic students, which is already possibly a bit of an issue anyway with this like athletic -y vibe. And it's going to single people out. You're doing it in front of everybody. It's going to single people out. We don't have the specific skill that's actually like useless in everyday life. I don't like swimming. Just ideologically, I just hate, I hate that. I hate the requiring such a specific skill. It seems so antiquated. People have defended it. I've talked to the Williams kids about it. You know, it's a useful skill to have. Or there's some statistics about a lot of kids drowning because it's not a skill that's taught anymore. Or apparently it can disproportionately affect like brown and black kids. 
which are like they're all valid like i don't need to discount that i just i hate that idea amherst has a slightly smaller student body which for me these schools are so tiny anyway that makes me a little nervous anyway i definitely want to lean towards the bigger sized school they both have a winter term um it's getting more common in these small liberal arts colleges i think williams does a little better everybody at williams also just raves about it so it sounds like you take one class um, and you have lots of time to go hiking and skiing. And I love skiing, so that, that's awesome for me. And sledding, and you just hang out with your friends, and the class is like pass-fail, and you can go to like lecture series, and this is a good time to like go out to nearby towns and stuff, and it just sounds so wholesome and nice and community building and just like a, a wonderful environment for learning. Of course, they canceled winter term this year because of COVID, so I'm sad about that. Amherst also has one. Honestly, you don't know how it works as well. Um, but it appeals to me a little less. I think they don't do it quite as well. So overall, it's just hard to wrap your head around all of this. It's hard to wrap your head around going to a school that's so different from everything that I know and just to try and imagine what it's going to be like. And you just can't understand what the culture is like. And it's so hard to describe the culture because it's just, it's just how things are, you know? And you have to base your decision off so much anecdotal evidence and that's just hard. I'm so sure that I made the right choice, but I wonder if I would have made a different right choice if we'd been in school still. Have a good day. Stay safe. Bye.